Hello, Doctor. Hello. How are you today? I'm fine, but I'm not a doctor yet. I'm still doing my PhD. <laughs> oh, okay. Apologies. No, no, Apologies. no, it's okay. It's okay. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Is is um, so your your name is um, can I can I ask how you say it, please? Uh, it's Hi. Georgia. Hi, Katarina. Hello. You already started. Hi, Georgia. Yes. Um, could you Georgia. make us Georgia. moderators? Um, so if you click on the our profile picture, uh -huh. uh, there should be an option on the bottom. Um, I... Make moderator. Sorry. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you. I am looking at... You already explained how I can pinpoint the, um, the link to the slides, but I cannot find it anymore. Um, yeah, so uh, do you see... Are you on your phone? Yes. Good. So do you see on the top, leave quietly? Do you see yes. that? Yeah, underneath there are three little dots. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And if you click on that, um, there yes. should be an option pinned link. Found it. Thank you. Yep. I and didn't look. scroll down. Katarina, I'm seeing you as a moderator here. Yeah, now I am. Uh, Georgia oh. made me moderator. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And cool, good. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I'm just checking that the slides are here. Yes, perfect. Please let me know if you can hear me well. Um, yeah, I can hear you well. Oh, okay. um, could you, so the slides are, um, are not accessible to everyone yet. So if you could go on Google Drive and change the settings to um, that everyone with, um, with the link is allowed to view. So if you, I don't know if you, do you have done that on your phone? Uh, I'm opening from my laptop. Okay, there's um, access and then restrict it and then you change it to, um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. I really Thank appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, I should, I just say that I'm in Italy right now and uh, the area where I am visiting my family is hit by blackouts often. So I hope oh. it doesn't happen during the presentation because otherwise the Wi-Fi dies. Oh, and, I'm sorry. Uh, is it stormy or, or no, is it heat? It's, it's the heat. Yeah. Oh, it's the heat. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, it's not, uh, we don't need the light because there's daylight. Uh, until late so it's fine it's just that the wi-fi turns off for a few minutes but it should be fine i i hope okay hi serena hi wisdom um yeah me, meet serena um and wisdom georgia uh wisdom he's a neuroscience uh, phd student uh, in harvard and serena works a lot uh, with ai for uh the Department of Defense, and she used to be at IBM a researcher too, just like you. Cool. Like <laughs> Hello, nice it's great, great to meet you. Yeah. Very, very happy to be here, uh, even if it's all virtual, but I guess it's uh, 2022. So. Nice to, to meet you. Here. Thanks for joining us. Of course, uh, my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we'll start in around three minutes, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I share, I'm sharing the um, article, it's uh, open source, um, the paper um, in the chat, if people want to, want to have a look at it um, again. And um, yeah, we'll start soon. Hi, Gilbert. Come up. 
Hi, Wayne, Martin, Eves, Saib. How is everyone? I'll, I'll mostly be listening today because I'm, I'm still sort of logged on. Shh, don't tell anyone, but I couldn't miss this talk. <laughs> I know, it's so interesting. Thank you for coming. Hi, Dee. How are you today? Hello there. Oh. Ah, it's, I'm all right, I guess. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for the thing, by the way. Yeah, sure. The whole crew is here almost. That's wonderful. Hi, Shane. Ian Mishmash. I hope I said the right name right. We'll start in two minutes, everyone. <laughs> I have a question about the title, though. Are there any uh, neurons without any dendrites? As far as I know, neurons have axons and dendrites already. All do, don't they? Yeah, but this is... Uh... Oh, Georgia, do you want to get take that I saw you yeah yeah mm. of course I mean I guess we'll get into that probably during the first slide uh, but uh, when you do spiking networks you not don't necessarily model dendrites you have like point like neurons if you want uh, but in this case we are using dendritic to compartmental models so that's why it's in the title uh -huh, thank you of course Have you been keeping out of the heat then if it's been so warm? It seems the heat wave is hitting everywhere just now. Is it Georgia? 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty warm. I mean, I don't uh, suffer. So it's it's fine. I prefer when it's warm than when it's cold. But still, for the whole environment and the water supplies, it's getting very bad where I'm living now. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, he I'm hearing a lot of people like having heat waves all over the place and the difficulties that are coming with that. Oh. Yeah, it's... Uh, Italy is always like, I mean always, often uh, not very caring about environmental problems and then gets the consequences when it's a bit too late. Um, even like in winter, there's not too much um, taking care of the road. So when it snows, everything falls. Um, but I guess you learn after a while, I hope. Yeah. Well, I, for one, took refuge in a supermarket where the air conditioners are set to freeze to death double or something, so I'm quite happy here. <laughs> yeah, it's the same here in the US. In the, in the summer, they put the AC that you have to wear a sweater inside, and then in the winter, they put the heat so warm that it's unbearable sometimes inside. It's, ridiculous but anyway <laughs> i do know the feeling yeah i always have a sweater with, sweater with me since i'm in the u.s in the in the summer because you know when i go inside it's freezing <laughs> anyways okay i think we can we can start um so welcome everyone to uh, science society and a special welcome to Georgia. Um, uh, I probably say your name wrong. Georgia. Oh, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Georgia. Okay. okay. And uh, let me introduce you, um, our guest speaker today, um, a little bit so you get to know her. Um, Georgia de la Ferreira. 
uh, is a PhD student at um, IBM. She joined the IBM Research Zurich Lab in 2020 as a PhD student in neuromorphic computing and um, groups. And she's particular, she is participating in a joint PhD program between the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and the University of Zurich and um, the IBM Research Zurich Lab. And um, during her PhD, she has been working as a visiting student at uh, the Harvard Medical School in the group of Professor Kreiman. And um, Georgia's current um, research focuses on developing biologically inspired training algorithms for artificial and spiking neural networks. She is also excited about applying machine learning models to predict and guide neural activity in the animal brain. And uh, Georgia did her master's in applied physics from the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne and has served as a research intern at the Okinawa Institute for Science and Technology in Japan. Logitech, the Swiss Space Center, and Imperial College London. So in her life, she did already so much. And in her free time, if you believe it, she has a little bit of free time. She has worked as a dancer and a dance instructor. That's wonderful. That's really great. I love when people also have their creativity. And um, if it's okay with you, uh, Jamie will um, ask you first like a couple of general questions and then it's time for you to present your amazing work. So go ahead, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for joining us, Georgia. And that is an incredible uh, bio there, I have to say. Um, and I'd like to start off just by asking you, please, um, what is it that, uh, first of all, got you into science? What fascinated you? Um, any stories you could remember um, on where you first found all this kind of stuff fascinating? Yes, yeah, sure. Actually, when I uh, was in high school, I chose to do a, a humanistic high school because I wanted to go towards history or philosophy. But then when I was doing that, I did a project uh, in astrophysics and that's where I decided I want to do physics and then as I was doing physics I um, had a chance to do a minor in neuroscience and I really like neuroscience so it's a super not non super linear uh, choice but science has always been there uh, and I'm uh, really happy now I've landed into computation and neuroscience because I get to see both uh, world of like programming and modeling and like more biological knowledge and try to bridge the gap uh, up at least give a small contribution towards that that's absolutely um, fascinating and this is this is my curiosity too um what's about the dancing what got you into that is that your dancing, family uh, thing? my father actually <laughs> Uh, no, I started when I was like three years old, so it was not really my decision. Um, but I've continued and I'm still doing it now. And it's uh, really nice because I have the scientific part of the day and then the more artistically part of the evening. Uh, so it's a good balance. But I still haven't found a way to merge the two. But we might work on a project with a choreographer in Zurich, uh, try to apply AI models uh, to chore choreography in contemporary dance, but it's still like at the brainstorming level. I'm really excited about it, but we'll see where it gets us. That really does sound exciting. And so what is the path that you took that led you up to the paper that you'll be discussing with us today? Uh, so you mean this specific uh, project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What is it that got you into this particular one? Yeah, yeah so um, I when I finished my master's, I had a few months gap before starting my PhD and I wanted to combine doing neuroscience with traveling. So I went to Japan for an internship. Um, I had l read the, the papers of Professor Fukai, who's the last author of the paper. 
And so I contacted him, invited me to, to join his club for a few months. And uh, uh, I was working when I was in Logitech on speech processing with Spike in Network. And uh, Professor Pukai had developed a new learning rule for Spike in Network. So we tried to combine the two aspects uh, between like my knowledge in uh, audio and uh, his uh, new algorithm. And this is how the, the paper came out. That's actually incredible. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to this now. Um, thank you so much for giving us those answers and uh, giving us a little bit of insight into what got you here. Um, and with the no further ado, please, Georgia, um, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, so I have shared the link with the slides. I put some slide numbers, so I hope you can follow me uh, easily. I'll try to remember every time I change slide to say it. But please, if anyone is lost or confused, stop me and then I'll try to, uh, to put everyone again on the same page. And then if there is anything unclear, um, ask questions uh, during the presentation. I'd really love it to be a, um, uh, an interactive discussion. Um, so I'll start uh, with the first uh, slide, um, which is the title, just to give a, a very quick overview of the points we're going to touch on during the presentation. So the idea is to uh, do recovering blind sources through mixture repetition. Blind sources are generally um, sounds or visual stimuli that uh, can be mixed. And uh, the idea uh, of the paper is to find a way through repetition uh, of these mixtures to recover them. So to um, uh, in, um, infer uh, what were the original um, signal sources before they were mixed. Uh, and then, as I briefly mentioned, um, the, the PI of the investigation is Professor Fukai, who's now at the Okinawa Institute for Science and Technology. Um, and uh, also, we work with Toshitaka Zabuki, who's uh, also, he was a postdoc uh, there at the time, now just moved to London. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see that this paper has been published just a couple of months ago. But actually, we worked on it probably three years ago now. And then it took a while to, to get the manuscript um, as a side project into the final version. So I hope I still remember all the details uh, if you want to know uh, very specifically what you did. Uh, but please don't be shy. So uh, starting with, um, with the second slide, uh, a bit on the, on the motivation of the project. So I mentioned that uh, we are working with a new learning rule that was developed in Fukai's lab. And that is then specifically to train artificial dendritic neurons. So we're talking about spiking networks, uh, which are a subset of artificial neural networks in which the node, which are the basic components of the network, uh, describe or try to mimic the dynamics of biological neurons. There are different ways of doing this, different types of spiking neurons. Uh, you may have heard about the leaky integrate and fire neurons, which are just one compartmental model, which means that the neuron is described basically just by one value, which is the voltage threshold, and then uh, by the binary behavior of spiking or not. But we are using a slightly more complex model that you see here in the leftmost panel, which is too compartmental. We have, as you can see, two sort of uh, units uh, that compose the neuron. The top one in the blue square that you see denoted as V is the dendritic compartment and basically represents the activity that the dendrites of the neuron are integrating from the presynaptic population or from the input signal, for example. And then from the, so uh, the dendrites, this signal travels through the soma, so from the top square to the bottom round part, which is the body of the neuron. Uh, and here is denoted as U. And by uh, comparing the activities of the dendrites and the soma, and seeing if there is any mismatch among the two uh, values as the neuron dynamic evolves, the, the weights that you see denoted as W in orange at the top are evolved. 
So I will not go into the details of the equations, but the main points uh, that you should keep in mind is that this rule is self-supervising. Uh, there is no explicit error signal and then has been specifically developed to learn temporal features. It has been previously applied uh, to a wide variety of tasks and also in another context and with other settings, it has shown to be able to perform blind separation of signals where, for example, uh, the signals are um, melodies played by two instruments at the same time. And then if we look at the right part of the slide, uh, what we want to uh, apply this learning rule, this model to, is an experiment that was proposed uh, in 2011 uh, by Professor McDermott, who is now at MIT, and that was published in PNAS, so about 10 years ago, it's quite an old experiment, uh, where the, the idea is to um, uh, do some blind source separation, so separating uh, signal sources, in this case acoustic sources, through repetition. So the idea is, if we look at the left part of this right quadrant, is that we're going to mix signals. For example, we mix the sound of a trumpet with the sound of a train, and then we present it to an observer. And then we, present, we mix the same sound of the trumpet with the sound of an elephant, and we um, present it to a listener. And then this is what we can call a sort of training phase. And then we ask the listener uh, to um, classify some sounds as sounds that have been previously played during the mixtures or not. So for example, if we uh, present the sound of the trumpet, the listeners has to say, yes, it was present in the mixture. If we present another instrument, the listener has to distinguish that this is an unseen sound. So this is one way that we can for perform um, blind source separation. But uh, let's now go a bit uh, in detail on what, what source separation is. So if we go on slide three, we'll just get uh, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I will first uh, give a, a brief overview of blind source separation in general and about the experiments that we're trying to model with the dendritic neurons. I'm going to give a bit of details on the network architectures and then present the results on three experiments on synthetic sounds that I'm going to explain how they are uh, generated. And then our um, extra results on real world stimuli that are an extension of the original experiments. So let's start with the experiments with human listener. If you go on slide five, uh, you can see an example of how blind source separation um, can be uh, illustrated. It is often referred uh, to as the cocktail party problem. Uh, in short, you have different sound sources that you can see here, for example, as a man singing, a man playing an instrument, a man playing uh, a trumpet. Uh, and then all these um, sounds are mixed together and recorded by some instruments such as microphones. And the problem of blind source separation is decoding the original sources. So given the overlapped signals, you want to uh, separate what signal is the singing, what signal is the violin, and so on. And if you go on slide six, we can see one of the solution among the many ones that have been proposed uh, in the past few years. So it has been shown uh, by McDermott and colleagues that humans can perform this blind source separation task by um, identifying sounds as patterns uh, that are occurring recurrently in mixtures. So we take, for example, uh, two scenarios. If you look at scenario A at the bottom in the train section, you see that we have one target sound, the red sound, which is always repeated in the mixture with the same sound in blue. And in this case, if we only uh, hear the, the target sound, so for example, it was the trumpet in our initial example, always in combination with the same sound, for example, the elephant, at the end, the listener cannot recognize if it has heard the sound or not, because he always relates it to the other sound. However, the discovery was if you um, present 
the sound in different mixtures. So this would be the case B, in which a training sequence contains the, the target sound, the red one, combined with two different masker sounds, the blue and the green. Then, after listening to these multiple mixtures, the human listener is able quite confidently to say if the, um, uh, the test sound was present or not. So you can see in the test column that we have two types of uh, sounds that are tested. Either the uh, red one that you see during the train, which is the target sound, or uh, depicted with the um, red uh, uh, with a black contour. It is what we call the destructor. So a destructor sound is a sound that is very similar to the target, but is not the same sound. So we want to make the task difficult for the listener and present a sound that is similar to what it has heard, but not identical. And then the listener has to distinguish that this is uh, an unseen sound. So if we go to slide seven, uh, you can see the types of sound that we're dealing with. We cannot use for this experiment sounds that are naturalistic because we have already heard sounds uh, previously in our life. So if we present a listener with the trumpet sound, it is not the first mixture that, um, the, mixture that the listener has um, listened the trumpet in. So the um, experimenters needed to create a new data set of sounds. And uh, to do so, they basically um, looked at a huge number of natural sounds. Based on their features, they built correlation functions. And from these correlation functions, they defined some Gaussian distribution, five in total, that combined with some noise uh, can uh, give rise, can generate uh, new sounds. In particular, they used five Gaussian distribu distributions, which correspond to the five rows of the images that you see, and, um, uh, and then 10 uh, types of sounds per Gaussian distribution, which would correspond to the columns. So um, these sounds, as you can see, are very similar across columns. So for example, if you look at the first row, uh, all the columns have um, some time frequency pattern that is uh, scattered around the, the, what is this called the spectrogram, this visual representation of the sound. While if you look at the bottom row, uh, you have that uh, there are some specific time frames at which the sound is high intensity, so it's yellow, and this is spread all across the frequency level. So in this way, um, uh, 50 different sounds were generated. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see how the destructor sounds are built. So the ones that we want to test the listeners on. So basically, let's say that our target is in panel A, and then we want to test the listener to another uh, sound that is similar. We basically sample another sound from the same Gaussian distribution. So from the same row among those that I've shown in the previous slide. And then to make the task even a bit harder, you randomly select one time slice, which is equal one eighth of the total um, length of the sound. And then you substitute the, this time slice with um, the same uh, value that you would have in the target. So now we have the basic units that we need for the experiment. So the target sounds that we are going to uh, mix with some masker sounds, and then the destructor sounds that we need for the test. Is anything um, uh, unclear for now, or uh, should I go on? For me, it's fine, but um, yeah, please flash your microphones um, if you have any questions so far. Okay, thank you. At least I have a feedback that you've heard me so far. I, I think, Maya, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, I do. Um... You know, let me know if we could talk about this, you know, uh, maybe a little bit later along in the presentation, but um, are you familiar, like, what's your familiarity level with ultrasonic uh, waves to um, kind of go through pipes and stimulate, uh, you know, utilizing frequencies either to clean pipes or to uh, put sound into, let's say, a fluid, um, which could then kind of heat it up, cause pressure, 
Um, are you um, familiar with, with that kind of technology? No, not really. Um, so are you bringing it up because you think it would be a suitable uh, sound source? Um, well, I'm just bringing it up to understand um, you know, I'm, I'm, the, the high frequency ultrasound capabilities to use as um, you know, potential energy conversion sources, um, you know? Mayor, this is a neuromorphic um, or an, a, like a, uh, the topic is, if you see about um, developing newer, better AI versions. Um, so it's, it's really off, kind of off topic. Um, got it, this. got it. That's what, that's what I was asking, I didn't know where, where we were at, but thanks for the clarification. Okay, thank you, thank you for the question. I have a um, quick question. Um, if if um if it's uh, okay here, um, you know you mentioned in your paper um the blind source decomposition problem. Uh, if you're going to address this a bit later on, I can wait for my question for later on, because I know that you're in the middle of something. Um, is it okay to ask about that just now? Yeah, 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 of course. Um, you mentioned um the blind source decomposition problem. Does that um include something like hearing a car coming like like in a, in a city you can't tell which direction it's coming from because the sound's bouncing against everything so um uh, it is more having different sound types and wanted to distinguish them so ah. from your example maybe you have the car sound but then you have i don't know a street musician playing nearby and so you have the two sounds that are mixed and you kind of want to understand that the overall sound is composed of two different sources, the car sound and then the musician sound, and you want to separate them. This is the overall problem. Right, right. Because that actually was one, one other quick thing then. It isn't part of what makes it difficult to distinguish a sound is that one sound can like supersede and even drown it out? Like, do they still keep being two sounds if they both have the same sort of similarities? Can that happen? Uh, so, sorry, can, can you just repeat the last sentence? Sure, sure. Um, as part of what makes it difficult to distinguish these two sounds um, is if one sound can supersede another sound and like, you know, drown it out. Mm -hmm. kind of kind of corrupting the sound making it yeah difficult to hear in that sense or or does the sound does the two sounds keep existing or can one like you know right over the other sound yeah so i would say if you want to go into the simplest scenario you would have the two sounds that have more or less the same intensity so you don't have one that is very very loud and one that is just a whisper because you want to make the task fair, then of course this is not reality, this is just AI benchmark to make sure that you're just narrowing down to the key factors. Uh, and then of course, if you have sounds that are very similar, it's going to be more complex to separate them. Uh, but what we are dealing with for these specific projects are these sounds that are synthetic, they are artificial, so they're not sounds that you would hear uh, in the everyday life. And this is done on purpose, first of all, because you don't want familiarity, but also to remove all these factors that are due to the nature of the, of the sound of, or, or like some more overwhelming um, presentation of a sound compared to another. Ah, okay. Thank you very much for answering. Thank you. Okay, good, good. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, okay, so I hope now the idea of the experiment that has been done in human uh, is clear. Just again to shortly summarize, humans are shown with uh, sounds in mixtures and then mixtures can be just one or multiple and then they have to recognize uh, in a test phase if within this mixture they have heard the testing sound or not. 
And the aim of the project is to see if we can reproduce this experiment by using a very simple spiking model. So if you go to slide 10, you're going to see the, uh, the model that uh, we came up with. It is a very, very simple model of the acoustic um, system, uh, and it's based on spiking neurons. So looking at the, at the pipeline, you start with a sound that you depict as a 2D image, which would be the spectrogram. The x-axis is the time, the y-axis is the frequency. So basically, this is a matrix of numbers uh, with an intensity that we normalize from 0 to 1, for example. And uh, to make the task a bit easier, uh, we uh, flatten this 2D matrix into one vector. So basically, we take each column of this image and then we stack the column on top of the others. And this would be the vector that you see um, uh, in the middle figure. And then, so you're going to have n pixels and you build a network so that the number of input neurons is also n. So for each pixel of the spectrogram, either its 2D version or its flattened version into a vector, you associate one neuron. This neuron is called the Poisson neuron because it follows a Poisson distribution for spiking. It's a probability distribution. Just in a simple way, if a neuron is associated to a pixel that is very bright, so it's very intense, it is going to have a high firing rate. This means that at each time step, its probability to spike is high. Conversely, if one neuron is associated to a purple pixel, so a low intensity pixel, uh, its probability to spike will be low. So when we want to uh, present an image to a spiking network, we have to convert it into spike. Basically, we present the image for a number of time steps that we define to be 400. And then for these 400 um, time steps, each neuron is going to spike with one probability defined by the pixel intensity. And this will be the activity of the input layer, the one that you see with the white uh, dots on the left. And then these uh, signal, these spikes, travel through the connections in gray, the ones that are called afferent synapses, excitatory or inhibitory. And then the, the signal travels through the output uh, layer, which are the nodes on the left part of the picture, that are inside the dendritic neurons. So coming back to the question I had at the very beginning, well, that was, don't all neurons have uh, dendrites? So in biology, yes. But as you can see, in this input layer, we have Poisson neurons that are just spiking or not. So their, it, their activity, it's a binary value. We don't have any complex information about what is dendrite and what is soma. It's either zero or one. Instead, the dendritic neurons that we have at the output are these two compart have these two compartmental structure in which the information from the input nodes will first flow to the dendrites V and then um, propagate to the soma U. And based on uh, the learning law that was proposed uh, by Professor Fokai, we train the weights that connect the input to the output node so that uh, the network can perform uh, our task. There are also other connections that make the picture a bit more complex, which are these light blue arrows that you see on the output layer. And these are lateral synapses that are inhibitory. Basically, we want the activity of the output neuron to be different across neurons. We want one neuron to spike uh, very strongly as a response to one input, but not one other input. And we want another neuron to have a different behavior so that the dynamics is non-trivial. Um, so just to summarize, if you go to slide 11, so the architecture is just this two layer network of spiking nodes. Uh, the connections are either all to all, this fully connected uh, option, or uh, sparse, which means that only 30% of the weights uh, are non-zeros. Uh, the number of input neurons is the same as the number of input pixels so that we can perform this rate encoding. And then in the output layer, we investigate a different number of neurons uh, 
the, this number doesn't change much in the results, but in the, um, in the picture plots that I show later, for the sounds we use eight neurons and for the images we use five. So, can I, uh, can I ask yeah. a couple of questions? Sure. Um, so, you're saying this is fully connected. Does that mean um, that every, you talked about in, in, inhibitory neurons in the output layer, are all of them fully connected with the uh, first layer? And are where is the inhibition targeted? Is it targeting the dendritic? compartment or the somatic compartment in the outer layer? Okay, sure. So we have all-to-all -all connectivity from the input to the output neuron. So these would be the uh, gray lines that you see in the image. And this can be both excitatory and inhibitory, meaning that the weights are both um, positive and negative. We initialize with a mean zero distribution, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then when I say about, uh, when I say that this can be either uh, all to all connectivity or uh, sparse connectivity, I'm talking about these gray weights. When I um, mention the lateral inhibition, basically you have uh, from here in the picture, if you look, we have all the connections originating from the fourth neuron from the top and going to all neurons at that are neighboring. Well, besides, I don't know why there's one arrow missing for the last neuron. But basically, you have this connectivity that is uh, unidirectional. And then it, this is from one neuron. And of course, just for uh, illustration purpose, we put one. But you could put for all the other neurons. And uh, the inhibition, uh, it. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think it targets the uh, dendrite because it's where you integrate the information from. And you don't want it to spike because you want the soma to um, reproduce what the dendrite is doing. And you want the dendrite to be silent if the neighboring neuron is spiking. And this is all feed forward, or is there any feedback signals coming back anywhere? All feed forward. All feed forward. And yes. the. Um, was, oh, so I, it's unclear to me, besides inhibition, lateral inhibition, what is targeting the dendrites? So are the feed forward connections targeting dendrites and somatic compartments or? Mm -hmm, I see. Uh, so they are targeting the dendrites. So the, yeah, as you can see, see in the in the dendritic neuron square, you have the weights that reach the, the V, so the yeah. dendrites. Yeah, and then yeah, basically yeah. what the soma is doing is trying to reproduce the dynamics of the dendrites. And if there is a mismatch, so if the soma is not well trained yet, then there is a change in plasticity. If there is not, so if the neuron has been trained well, because we're talking about temporal processing, we have for 400 time step, the presentation of the same input, so that the soma has enough time to learn how to follow what the dendrite is doing. And this so, gives the possibility, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the, and this gives the possibility of learning these weights between the input nodes and the dendritic compartment of the output nodes. Awesome, so last question, and uh, I don't wanna derail you anymore. Uh, we can no, always no, set this aside and talk to later. Answer. I am curious about the learning rule, though. Uh, is it similar to Walter Sen's work, where uh, we're talking about dendritic predictive coding, where the uh, basically the cells trying to equilibrate the the neuronist, the dendrites are trying to predict the somatic compartment and this kind of thing, and we use that to drive. Well, in this case, there's just bottom up synapses, right, in the, mm -hmm. the somatic compartment. Yeah, so to be honest, I, I don't uh, remember how Waltersen's um, uh, predictive uh, rule works. Uh, I Maybe because I didn't prepare backup slides that are so technical, uh, but basically it is a somatodendritic mismatch minimization. So you compute the KL divergence, and this is what you want to minimize. 
Uh, yeah, that's the same concept. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thanks for the question. Okay, I'll go ahead then to the experiment from the original data sets. So if you go on slide 13, you have the details of how the training works. Uh, if you remember what we are presenting uh, the human listeners with are these mixtures. Actually, in the human experiments, um, the human the listeners are presented just once with the mixtures and then they are, they are tested. Te tested. Uh, while uh, in our experiment, uh, we need uh, a bit longer training process, which means that we build a mixture. We can see uh, both the A or the B cases uh, on the top right of the slide. And each sequence is presented 3000 times. Basically, uh, if you remember the uh, mixtures, so the spectrograms of the mixtures are encoded into spiking, then we let the dynamics evolve and the learning rule trains the weights. And uh, you can see in the uh, top uh, bottom right plot how the weights change as we um, present the train sequence. So you can see that the delta W, which is the magnitude of the weight change, uh, is pretty high at the beginning of the training and then after about 1000-1200 iteration uh, there is already saturation so the weights have been learned already uh, and uh, going back to the learning rule uh, so it's basically a sort of Hebbian learning rule which means you have pre and post synaptic uh, information for the weight change and then you have back propagating action potential so this is what I was mentioning. You have a sort of um, prediction attempt from the SOMA uh, that wants to uh, learn what the, the pattern that the dendrites uh, are encoding as activity is. And uh, uh, if you remember from the architecture slide, we have this light blue arrow that represents the lateral inhibition. Uh, that gives rise to the competition across the neuron so that each neuron responds differently to the same input. Uh, and this is implemented through ISTDP, so inhibitory spike timing dependent plasticity, which is a learning rule that is based on the time difference of the spike of pre and post synaptic nodes, and in this case, uh, lateral uh, connected neurons. So, to keep in mind, we present the network with these mixtures for 3000 times, and then we test it. So now it's slide 14. In the test, we present instead the testing sequence, which is um, composed by single sounds, not mixtures anymore. And the single sounds are the targets and masking sounds, which can be the red, light blue, and green colors, or in the picture, even the yellow. And then we present the destructor sounds that, if you remember, are sounds that are similar to the sounds composing the mixtures, but are a bit different. And we want to detect if the network is responding differently, for example, uh, to the red versus the red and black sound. And um, I mentioned we have uh, eight output neurons on the, for the sound task. And you can see uh, for each row, the activity of each neuron in terms of firing rate um, as a response uh, to the different sounds during the test sequence. Uh, and this is one presentation. Then we present it 50 times and then again 20 times in a loop so that we have a nice averaging because you can see that there is some oscillation. So how do we go from uh, these um, uh, res population response in which we see how each neuron responds to a sound to uh, the classification that we did with human subjects. So uh, saying if, if the sound was in the mixtures or not. In slide 15, uh, we see the first step of going uh, from the activity to the final response, uh, which is basically uh, applying just simply PCA um, to uh, reduce the dimensionality of the response. So when we have eight neurons, 
Each data point is eight dimensional, which is quite difficult to visualize. So we go back to two dimensions and apply PCA uh, to the responses. Here you see for each point, the response uh, to the target and the masker sound. So the red, light blue, green, and yellow sound. And each point color corresponds to one of the sound IDs. Uh, you see that sounds, uh, points corresponding to the same sounds are closed in space. This means that the uh, response uh, is similar, but there is some variability. Indeed, if you remember, all the encoding process relies on a Poisson process, so there is some noise within the encoding. Then we go to slide 16, and we uh, perform the next step. So based on the PCA uh, that we've done in the previous step, now we um, apply a Gaussian mixture model to um, uh, locate in the PCA space some Gaussian distributions that describe the targets and masker sounds, so the sounds that have been presented during training, which are now represented all in blue. And as you can see, the, the contour lines of the Gaussian mixture model follow accurately the clusters produced by the targets. Then we plot on this space the response of the destructors, which are in green. And some of them are overlapping with the targets, but most of them, as you can see, are far away from the clusters in between. So being close or far, from the clusters is the measure that we call log likelihood. And when the contour lines are dark, the log likelihood is high, close to one, so the purple areas. When the um, log likelihood is low, so the probability of one point to belong into one cluster is low, then we have this um, uh, orangish color. And ideally, uh, our um, aim is that if the model is able to distinguish targets from destructors, then the destructors will not fall close to the targets in the GMM. So if you go to slide 17, we basically divide just empirically the range of the log likelihood into some bins that are corresponding to one answer um, uh, per point. So if the log likelihood of a point is larger than zero, it means that the point is in the cluster and the network is saying, yes, this um, data point, this sound uh, has been presented into, uh, in the training mixtures. If at the opposite, the log likelihood is very, very small, so smaller than minus 15, the network is saying, no, this point is very far away from the clusters that we defined with the targets, so this is a destructor. And the answer is true, no. And then the intermediate ranges are yes and no. And at this point, uh, we have exactly the same information that the human subject provided us, because also the human subject were saying sure yes, yes, no, or sure no. And based on the responses, so you can go now to slide 18, we build a rock curve. And slide 19, we compute the area under this curve. So if the um, classification is perfect, we are basically going to have a vertical line and then a horizontal line. So more or less what we have in this figure. And the area under the curve is one. So the performance is perfect. No destructor is classified to be close to the targets and all the targets are close enough to be within the clusters. If instead the destructor points fall on top of the target, then we are going to have a line which is diagonal, just two points, so going from 0, 0 to 1, 1, and therefore it's just a, the, the lower part of a triangle, and this is 0 0.5, the area under the curve, and this corresponds to the chance level. So basically, just summarizing these slides, after, test, uh, sorry, after training, we freeze the weights, we compute the network response uh, to the targets and the destructor sounds, we build a PCA space based on the targets, on the PCA space we apply the Gaussian mixture model 
um, to define the Gaussian distributions. On top of the target space, we project the destructor responses. And then for targets and destructors, we compute the log likelihood. And based on this classification, we, um, we uh, obtain a rock curve. And if um, the, the network is able to distinguish target and destructor, we obtain area under the curve one, otherwise we obtain 0 0.5. So uh, if there's any question, I think this is a good moment. Otherwise I'll go to the results. Okay, I'll go to the results. So uh, the first experiment that we tried is varying the number of mixtures. So you can see um, on the left um, quadrant, we have three cases, one uh, mixture only. So we always have the red sound in combination with the blue one. Then, and here uh, the experimental results have shown that the human cannot distinguish targets from destructors. Second case, we have two mixtures, so two max master sounds. Third case, we have three master sounds and three different mixtures. We extended this uh, in towards the experiment one all combination protocol, in which in addition, we also um, present during training the mixtures between the other master sounds, so like the blue with the green. And on this protocol, then we tested the model now is it's slide 21. We um, look at the network response uh, when we only train it with one mixture. And you see in panel A that the um, response is quite oscillating, but very close uh, independently of the sounds. So then when we build the PCA space, we only have the two sounds, which are 1 and 45, you can see, and they all fall in the same cluster. And then when we put the GMM and the destructor sound on top, which would be panel C, the um, orange and uh, red colors, this falls all on top. So basically targets and destructors are not distinguished by the network. And you see, because the activity in panel A is very similar, independent of having correct or incorrect probes, which is another way of say target and destructor. But if you now move to slide 22, uh, in panel D, you see the response after the network has been trained with three mixtures. And you see now that the activity is very um, um, pronounced uh, for some neurons and some specific sounds. For example, neuron one spikes a lot um, as a response to uh, the sound in blue, neuron two as a response to sound in green, and so on. And these responses are different when we present the destructors. So now if we apply the same pipeline and we look at what happens in panel F, you see that some destructors are indeed confused with the targets, but many others are actually um, classified as away from those clusters. So to summarize the performance, uh, slide 23 now, uh, we, what we are interested in is having one mixture that is chance level, which is what happens in human performance. If you look at the right histogram on the right. And what we see is that out with our dendritic model, the performance is also close to 0 0.5. When we increase the number of mixtures, uh, like in the human experiment, you have an above chance um, uh, accuracy. Uh, the limitation of our model is that after six mixtures, however, the accuracy goes back to chance level, which is probably due to the fact that now we are testing a lot of sounds, so the PCA space becomes very crowded and it's difficult for the destructors to be away from the, the targets. Uh, we also tried with all the combinations, so if you have more a longer training sequence, which is Xi24, and we observe that there is not a big change. Then we tried other experiments. Slide 25, uh, experiment two, we alternate with single sounds. So now we don't only have um, mixtures, but we also have single sounds alternated with the mixtures in different um, protocols. I'm going to speed up a bit because uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, and then experiment three instead has a, some temporal delay. So we have the same number of mixtures, but we uh, increase the number of single sounds um, 
among mixtures. So you see, for example, in case zero, there are only mixtures, but in case two, we have two sounds every, um, every other mixtures. And if we go now to slide 26, you see uh, our results compared with the human performance. So for experiment two, case A and C are both above chance level, similarly to the human performance, while the biggest problem of our model is that case B, it's above chance for our model, while it's not for the human performance. And this can be due to the fact that when you are presenting sounds isolated, our model is picking up features that may be in the mixture sounds as well, and, and those they can distinguish it while in, uh, in reality human listeners cannot. Instead for experiment three, we have uh, quite a nice reproduction. So as the, uh, num as the delay uh, between mixture presentation increases, also the performance um, degrad degrad degradates um, between our model and the human performance. So this concludes uh, our reproduction of the experiments done in the original paper, but we also extended this pipeline to other um, um, input sources, starting with uh, sound sources um, in slide 28. So you may remember that I mentioned that um, in the human experiment, they didn't uh, use natural sound because it was a trivial task for people. But our model doesn't have any familiarity with naturalistic sounds because it's just randomly initialized basically. Um, so we can extend the experiment and see if we can perform the same task with uh, sounds that are more complex. Uh, the only issue is that we cannot have a rigorous uh, pipeline to build the destructor because if you remember we were using a Gaussian distribution to build a destructor and here we have uh, harmonic sounds. So we're just going to see a qualitative evaluation. In slide 29 we see an example of how the spectrogram of some naturalistic sound look like and how so we have the two um, um, single sounds on the left and then we sum them and you see a sum a summed signal on the right this is the mixture that we are presenting in training and uh, if you go on slide 30 you see a very similar plot to what we've seen before so if we only have one mixture then the network response is not specific for the different sounds and the two targets and the incorrect and, and the destructor, which is just another naturalistic sound in this case, they all fall within the same cluster. But if we look on slide 31 and perform the same experiment with three mixtures, now there is quite a nice um, distinction of the cluster you can see that with the naturalistic sounds, the clusters are more compact and they're also far away from each other, more than the synthetic sounds. So this means that the task is easier for the network. And then on the F panel, you see that the destructor in orange falls very far from all the other clusters. So this means that the performance of the network is basically perfect. And we did a similar experiment extending to visual stimuli. So on slide 33, you can see um, a brief introduction. Uh, the idea was uh, not, let's say, risky, because also when we are performing experiments with sounds, we are treating them as images, so we can use exactly the same network. However, well, we have to tune a bit the parameters, but it's the same pipeline. Uh, however, the result is non-trivial because the, the distribution of the intensity within the image is different from spectrograms to naturalistic images. Fortunately, this worked. So uh, on slide 34, there's an example of mixing two images, such in the same way as we do with the spectrogram. And then on slide 35, we see the example using these uh, four images on the uh, uh, right side of the slide. And then you see also here, circle with the um, um, black circle, that different neurons respond uh, differently to different uh, sounds. So we have quite a nice um, distinction also among uh, the presented images and the destructor, which is in purple. And slide 36 shows that you can obtain the 
exact same results also by changing images, uh, just an artistic uh, choice here. And uh, to summarize, so I'm now on last slide 37, uh, what we've done is to exploit a learning row uh, for dendritic models uh, to build a very, very simple um, computational model of the auditory system, which we applied to see if this model was able to reproduce the results of uh, blind source separation through repetition. So beside the experiment that I've pointed out, most uh, of, the, of the protocols that we tested uh, gave quite a good reproduction, maybe not in absolute value, but in chance level versus non-chance level. And also using a computational model allowed us to extend um, some results, make maybe some prediction uh, compared to the human experiment, because if we just have to run a code and we don't need to take a lot of people in the lab uh, and do experiments. However, there are definitely some drawbacks of our model. First of all, if you remember, we are flattening the spectrogram. This means that we lose information about the temporal uh, structure and we present a sort of static stimulus for 400 um, time step. So this is something we should work on and uh, take into account in a, um, uh, in, uh, in a following project. Also, um, we have a spiking core, but we have a lot of processing and post-processing that are not spiking. So it would be also good uh, to have um, an, a different way of performing, for example, PCA, which is spiking based. And talking about PCA, having this two dimensional um, representation when the task becomes more complex um, leads, to the per leads to performance degradation. So another, uh, we, we could exploit other ways of doing dimensionality reduction that don't have these um, side effects. But just to summarize everything, we have a self-organizing network because of how the uh, learning rule works. So it would be really great to have some collaboration with um, hardware groups uh, that are looking for um, models to do audio uh, processing tasks in neuromorphic hardware because this would alleviate uh, some of the problems associated, for example, with doing uh, error-related uh, backpropagation. So with this, um, uh, I'll wrap up my presentation. Thank you very much for the questions you had during the presentation. If you have any other comment, suggestion, or question, I'm really happy to discuss. Um, Thank you so much for your great, great presentation. Um, this was such an interesting work. Um, and um, yeah, it's um, yeah, you did a really amazing job explaining it. Um, Frank, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no worries. I have c kind of like three different questions. And first of all, I'm a social scientist and an audio engineer, but I'm not as close uh, to the to this neuroscientific setup like Wisdom is. So I um, still have a little the trouble how this how these uh, neuronal activities have been observed you you said ex, uh, experiment a lot of times and i'm i didn't get what is the empirical data in here at put into what type of model model this, that would be my first question i have to to others okay sure so the empirical data that we want to reproduce are data done on human experiments. There is no uh, recording involved. So may you, if you go to slide six, you see a very simplified version of the protocol. You present uh, the, the listener, the subject, uh, with some mixture, either one or two or three, or depending on the protocol. And then you ask, and then you present a single sound, which is either one sound that the person has listened to in the mixture, or a similar sound, but that was not in the mixture. And then the person has to say, this sound was in the mixture or not, and has to reply, sure, yes, yes, no, or sure, no. And then they do this with a number of patients, I don't remember how many. And then based on that, they build this rock curve that we also use for our pipeline. So there is no neural recording 
in the human experiment. Instead, in our pipeline, we have to find a way for going from the um, network activity that we have run to the uh, yes, no, sure, yes, sure, no. So if you go in slide 19, our empirical data now is the leftmost plot, the one that you have in which you see the neural activity per neuron as a response to different sounds. And then all the pipeline, so let's say the novelty of the work, it's a way for going from that response to a yes, no, sure, yes, or sure, no response, which we've done. So basically, the neural recording are just simulation in our experiment. Does this answer your question? Yeah, got it. Uh, thanks. So the next question would be, uh, can you, with this work, kind of differentiate between how an animal model would uh, work and how a human model would work? So let's um, say the difference between uh, the reactions of mice or something like that and humans. I see. I, that's a, definitely an interesting point. But I, I think, so for how our model works, it is so simple that is very, very difficult to say this is a model for a human auditory system. It is like a very, very basic way of encoding sound and then decoding into a classification spike, uh, a classification output, sorry. Um, to be honest, I don't know much about the animal auditory system. I think Um, you cut out there, Georgia. Are you with us? And Georgia? It seems like uh, you got in, in a weird matrix. We don't hear you anymore. I think her speaker might have um, cut out for a second. She said that this would maybe happen if there was a power cut or something. Katerina, you can't hear anything, right? Um, no, Jamie, I can. You guys hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. We can hear you. Yeah, I, um, I think uh, Clubhouse is acting up again. It dropped me for like five minutes. Uh, oh, it did? Oh. Oh. Right. Um, Georgia, if you can hear. Oh, now we can she's hear back. you. Oh, she's back. Hello. Yeah, okay, you're back. Sorry. Okay, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're back. Sorry, did this answer the question? I, I stopped hearing uh, at some point. Uh, we didn't hear your answer. We just uh, oh. heard um, the question. Okay, sorry about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'll say it again. So I, I was saying that. Um, I am sure that the animal system has some way of performing blind source decomposition. Because, for example, uh, if you think of an animal in danger, it needs to be able to distinguish like the predator that's approaching from the background of the river that is flowing, for example. But I am not aware if there are similar experiments done with mice. For sure, it's more difficult to get a a uh, verbal response. I mean, it's impossible to get a verbal response. Maybe you can decode some behavior from it. But um, another point that I was mentioning is that our model is very general. So it's not, we use it to reproduce experiments done on humans, but um, it is not a f um, trustworthy reproduction of the human auditory system. It's just a let's say, a very simple way of going from an um, acoustic input to a, a classification output. 
Yes. Okay. So thank you. That kind of uh, all of these um, answers uh, lead into my last question, and it's interesting because I'm I'm doing in my free time kind of an uh, quite similar experiment, not to to predict something on on a neuronal uh, level, but um, uh, towards uh, recognition and focus of meaning in multi-speaker settings. So this kind of cafeteria uh, situation where there are uh, multiple parties speaking, uh, I do wonder uh, what, uh, to what extent um, these, uh, just similarly to what uh, what you are doing here, to what extent uh, not only the, the recognition of different voices could happen, uh, but also how much of um, of the differing factors could be uh, recognized. So uh, I would be curious what do you think on the recognition of not just tones, but actually the the words. Uh, what would you expect with what what you've uh, learned so far from your experiment? How much could uh, any meaning be recognized, and um, to what extent pl uh, do the factors volume and pitch, notes, spatial position, and distance from the speakers play into the possibility of recognizing a, a, a content of words if you uh, if you could speak to that mm -hmm. so that's a super interesting point uh, thanks for uh, bringing it up so in terms of uh, features of the sounds within this task if you look for example as light 29 um, if I'm not wrong and I remember correctly the top left figure is speech so you see that the, um, that the frequencies uh, that are high intensity are mostly those uh, towards the low range of the, pre of the, of the scale. Uh, but this works as well when you have like chimes, which would be the bottom left figure in which you have uh, quite a different structure. So the model is general enough to work both on these highly structured sounds and those synthetic sounds that we've seen um, at the very beginning. So this is not uh, an issue, but in terms of uh, speech recognition, for example, uh, we would need to implement a different um, pipeline. So we would still be able to use the network in the way it is, so using the uh, input no neurons and then the output neurons um, but then we would have a different decoding structure so for example if you go on slide um, sorry if you go on slide 19 again you would have the first step but then for example instead of doing PCA to perform classification you may need to use a different way to do readout from the neuron responses to relate the neuron responses to words, for example, which I have not done, um, but it could be an interesting uh, extension of the, of the network. All right, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for the question. I wanted to just make a quick comment and then uh, a follow-up question sure uh on the on the question about the animal like doing experiments for this in animals this would actually be pretty interesting to do uh i thought about playing around with this but i but i haven't um like you said you could do a behavioral response uh you know train the animal to uh demonstrate that it can pick out maybe a sound in a mixture and do, you know, do the traditional psychometric function. But you could also apply the method you did to your network to the uh, neural data. In other words, you could um, uh, make a classifier over the neural responses in, in the same way. Um, yeah, that's a great idea, so actually. Yeah, so th this, th this is pretty popular these days, neurometric versus psychometric functions. Um, and it would lay over perfectly with, with what you're simulating. Um, I was wondering though about, um, you, you, you did the, um, 
classification using the mixture model on, in 2D uh, by using the first two principal components. I'm curious how much variance was explained with the two uh, dimensions and whether you wouldn't do better at classifying in, in higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have actually the number on the paper. Let me look for it um, because I've measured the variance. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, yeah, okay, you're fine. Okay. Um, so the variance that we explain, it was pretty high, uh, but just give me a second. I don't remember the. So I mean, it's I mean not too not too high, but it's about forty percent of the entire annular response. So a consistent percentage, but we are losing a lot. So. Definitely, this is one of the of the drawbacks of the model, which wouldn't be too hard to fix, yeah. actually. Yeah, to me, that says if you added just one more dimension, you might be able to separate these clusters pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, you're totally right. Um, it's something that the reviewers suggested uh, as well, uh, and then we decided to not to change too much the pipeline. Um, but it's a, an excellent point. Thank you for um, for commenting with it. Um, yeah, um, thank you so much for for this amazing work. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you are collaborating with. Uh, we had here um, Dr. Guat. Uh, from from IBM too. I don't know if you know him. Uh, no, no, and actually not. What's his name? Sorry. Uh, um, let me check again how to to spell it because I maybe said it wrong. But anyways, the question was if you are looking into next to implement something like a synaptic plasticity modeling um, to basically um, have some sort of excitability changes uh, to keep um, the memory basically of different sounds or is that something you know that is really out of your scope to to do that um that's actually something interesting um but no right now i'm not working on this project anymore so we've wrapped it up with the paper uh, and um I'm not looking into particular extensions right now, but if ideas uh, come up, why not? Oh, I looked them up. It's Agazi Sawat. Ah, yes, I think it's in my office. Is it IBM Zurich, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He, he was here like a couple of months ago. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because he, he looks at in-memory technologies for deep learning acceleration. Yeah, yeah, that's him. They have a very interesting mm -hmm. hardware, but I would say that it's uh, uh, it still needs a bit of working to get to these tasks that are a bit more complex than the benchmark ones that they're testing now. Yeah, great. And... Um, so you mentioned that you can basically also use a visual um, input and have a similar, like you can use this um, design to also process visual inputs, correct? Yes, yes, that's okay. correct. Are you thinking of someday applying this maybe to a sense of smell? I know it's really hard to uh, process um, sense of smell um, information. But I read there's some, um, you know, there's a lot of effort to having um, accurate sensors. Um, is there, do you think, you know, um, you could also process that type of data um, just as well? I think it wouldn't be too difficult if the encoding is done in a similar manner. So I'm not too familiar with olfactory um, um, sources processing, but I would say that like when you encode them, each, uh, let's say why, with the sound, we have different frequencies, and then you have one pixel and then one neuron per frequency and time frame. 
I guess with olfactory um, processing, you would have molecules instead of uh, frequencies. And then if a molecule is present, you have a spike. If it's not present, you don't have a spike or something like that. I'm not 100% sure uh, that this is how, how it is done. But if this is the way, then it, in principle, I wouldn't see a reason why the pipeline wouldn't work. That's, uh, that's exciting. So in theory, you could process any sensory information um, and distinguish better between different inputs. Also, let's say tactile uh, processing um, for, uh, let's say, um, artificial skin. Mm -hmm. Maybe people that lost their um, sense, you know, an ALS, and so that lost the ability to uh, move and um, you know, paralyzed people. So that would be quite amazing if your approach would be better at processing um, artificial sensory input, basically, for people that have different, um, you know, lost different senses. It would be really oh, cool, I yes. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, we didn't think about cool. it, but now that you mention it, it's like uh, obvious you can do all the senses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. I wish, you know, I hope you'll do that because, you know, um, yeah, it, it would help people so much. And if we could translate it into, um, you know, um, an input for people in another spot. I'm thinking about Miguel Nicolilo's work where he had, he created an exoskeleton mm -hmm. and um, that had basically sensors where the feet usually would be and created basically a tactile input on a region on a skin where people still had a sensation, like on the arms, for example, if they just had we were just paralyzed um, uh, from, you know, the, the legs down. So you could basically, if people like an LS and so gradually lose their, their kind of senses and their controls of movement, you could, you could have the type of an exoskeleton that, that feeds that in, let's say into the neck or where, wherever that would be, or maybe even directly into the brain with some, some chips that that would be amazing um to have the input because we had uh, a room here uh, where a researcher um where we had different rooms where researchers were good at um uh, reading out basically what is happening in the brain the, of course speech like to fasten up speech and and locked people that were locked in or imagery but the other way around, I think, is still lacking, and that's where you can <laughs> it. <laughs> would be really cool. It would be super interesting. Yeah, I mean, with sounds and images, it's easy because these are data sets that you can either build very quickly by, I don't know, looking up images um, on, on Google or uh, looking at sound recordings that you have on your phone under our public database. I'm not sure. Uh, I think olfactory and tactile are lagging a bit behind. Maybe now there are some common benchmarks, but I guess when you have something that's so easy to uh, try your model on, then you go with the easiest way. Uh, but for sure, it would be super interesting to see if it also works um, for definitely for olfactory, because you can have superposition of um, different smells, different odors. I'm not sure tactile, how you could combi combine two um, tactile um, perceptions. Maybe like you can combine, I don't know, uh, temperature with texture, something like that. Um, but yeah, something to, to, to write down and keep in mind. Yeah, maybe just from two hands, you know, to from both sides, like the same object, but from from the opposite side. So uh, I don't know if that would be enough. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, to distinguish, probably not. But yeah, maybe two type of textures. Um, that would be really interesting. Yeah, so 
Yeah, I, I don't know, to, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to, uh, I have to run off to a meeting, unfortunately, but I, I wanted to thank you for the talk and for just presenting your work. There's a massive overlap in our interests. Uh, clearly, I, I, uh, I study biological dendrites and, and build models of uh, dendrites, single cell and, and networks. And uh, I came into neuroscience from the auditory field and spent a lot of time thinking about this fine source separation problem. So super interesting for me. Um, I just wanted to comment on uh, the reason I, I was uh, so interested in this uh, cocktail par party problem, as they call it, is it sits inside of this larger fine source separation problem. Uh, and, and general solutions to this problem would affect every field. Any field that has a dimensionality problem at a sensor which is every field would benefit from a general solution to this. Um, so really, really cool stuff. Uh, I, I'm in the Boston area and I know some of, uh, I heard you say something about working with, with Gabriel, um, mm -hmm. but would be curious to uh, see what you're up to these days, but i um, gonna have to take off right now, unfortunately. Yeah, let's catch up. I'll be in Boston in a month, more or less. So. I don't know okay. if you can see my email somewhere or give me your name through message. I'm not really familiar with the app, but um, it would be really interesting also to know what you're working on. Sounds good. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your question. I, I can always connect. Yeah, I can always connect you too. Are you going to Gabriel's uh, uh, lab? Uh, yeah, so I was working with Gabriel. I mean, I'm still working, but now I'm working from oh, Switzerland. Okay. And I'll be visiting again yeah. this summer. Great. That's amazing. Yeah, I can always connect you through email, so uh, please let me know. Frank, you, you and Mike. Frank, you can go ahead. I'm sorry. I saw you and Mike. Okay, maybe um, so. Yeah, I wanted to check. In. Oh, you can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear can you. Hear yeah. Me? Okay, so my app is so. Uh, now you mute it mute. again. I'm sorry. Yeah, the app is kind of glitchy. I'm sorry about that, too. Do you to... No, it's fine. Fine. We cannot hear you again. Maybe you wanna. Uh, leave and come back in really quick. Sometimes that helps. I'll just do ah, that. Now, now it works. Now we hear you. Oh my goodness. We we hear. Can somebody else hear Frank, or is it just me? Uh, I cannot. I hear him come in like for a split second, and he's gone again like that. So and now I, gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I reset the app. This app is so super glitchy uh, as of the late updates. I just wanted to point out that Marty, who is on stage, and Pierre, who is uh, in the follow-up by speaker sections, they both wrote questions into the chat. So Marty, if you uh, uh, w want to uh, ask your question, you should just uh, and Mike can go ahead, and maybe Pierre also wants to uh, come up. I just want to point that out because it's in, it's in the chat, and I thought it was on uh, uh, on the topic. Ah, thanks for mentioning. I didn't oh. check the chat. Uh, I was too focused on, on the audio. Yeah, it's not. It was my job. Uh, thank you, Frank, for mentioning it. So. Madi, do you want to ask first, and then we'll ask the um, Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question that, uh, is there any impl implementation of uh, your model on GitHub or other repository? Yes. So uh, if, you, if you open the paper and just uh, do Control F GitHub. I'm reading the paper. It comes up. Actually. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't remember which page is it. Let me just do a quick search. Um, but yeah, there is to reproduce one of the experiments, but then the code is the same. So it's page 17 in the data availability. There is the code. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another question that I, can I use this uh, actually uh, DAN or ADN 
for implementing generative models such as uh, Jan, my means is, uh, uh, can I be, uh, make a generative model such as uh, Jan models, but uh, instead of using uh, 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 usual uh, neural nets such as perceptron, I use uh, ADN neurons. Is uh, is it possible? So I guess they are a bit too simple for uh, guns. And definitely you would have a different way of training them because you need uh, a generator and a discriminator. So definitely with this specific model, no. But I'm not sure if there are some other models that are spiking and that there are generative. I mean, spiking is a bit behind the um, progress of just general ANNs. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're not there yet because it's much more complex to, to train this kind of network. So as you can see, we only have one layer while GANs are much more complex and deeper. So I, I'm sorry, I don't think um, it's the, the field is there yet, but please let me know if you find uh, some other uh, dendritic neuron um, models that can, uh, can do that. So uh, it's not proper for uh, applications uh, such as uh, TTS, um, I mean, this takes to a speech uh, or uh, generating uh, a speech from uh, other features. So there is, uh, there are some uh, spiking models, but th that are non-dendritic, so just one compartmental. Uh, there, there is a, um, a postdoc in my lab that's working on that, uh, and the, the, the type of model is called SNU, which stands for Spiking Neural Unit, but that is trained with backpropagation, so with um, supervised signal, and can perform speech processing. Um, but I'm not aware of models that work with dendritic neurons uh, to do that. Uh, if uh, we use uh, Fourier transfer of the wave instead of using uh, the signal uh, directly, uh, you think uh, how will be our result? Uh, I mean, is FFT is uh, good pro pre-process for this model or not? Mm, that's a, a question that unfortunately I'm I not sure I can answer. I mean, I don't. I don't know what the answer would be. Um, yeah, no, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I don't know. OK, thank you very much. Sorry. I'm done with my speech. Just to uh, highlight it, the, the model is in, in that uh, linked paper on page 17, and it's uh, on GitHub, Georgia D and then slash dendritic neuron BSS. So that, that was on that model that is in this paper. Yeah, thanks for pointing it out. So uh, Katarina, I, I don't know, uh, I have a hard time to access the um, chat without um, uh, without waiting, uh, without having to wait a minute to access it. So maybe you could read out the, the question over yeah. here. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, so here is asking if you could use this uh, for um, emotion detection. Um, for instance, can you imagine that the loss of temporal info is actually a plus in that case because you could overlap various levels of emotions in the same spectrogram and make it easier for the model to find clusters? Um, can jump on stage, but thank you very much. and. Um, that's a very creative question. Uh, so <laughs> we've uh, reviewed all the different um, sensory uh, uh, sensory senses. Uh, so emotions, it's uh, <laughs> very interesting, actually, uh, a, a bit unexpected. Uh, so I've not thought about it. Um, I'm a bit pragmatic. So when you want to use this kind of model, it's good that you have some signal. I am not sure if you're talking about emotions in general or like 
decoding emotions from, for example, behavioral data. I don't know, you have a collection of data that are sweating, smiling, uh, loud voice, uh, or uh, other, other factors that can relate to emotions. If you have something like that, that then you can encode into some numeric form, which then can lead us to have spike trains, then I guess you could do that. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I'm really not familiar with the field, so uh, I don't know, maybe there are some um, computational works that analyze emotion in a quantitative manner, uh, which if there are, I would be really interested in knowing more. Uh, so again, just short answer to the question, if you can put emotion into some uh, matrix or vector, I guess that would be doable, yes. Um, but my question for you is, do you know if there are some ways of um, encoding emotions into numbers? Hi, um, Georgia. May I ask, um, I was reading your paper, um, the part here, now I wrote down the question because it's a long one. Um, when non-negative matrix factorization is useful in extracting spatiotemporal patterns within audio, um, I was trying to understand that part a bit better, but when with regards to that, um, does that mean it could separate all the separate notes say like played on a guitar if someone strummed it or if there was even an orchestra all playing things together would it be able to separate all of these things and and hear where everything's from what pitch it is what note and everything uh-huh i see so non-negative matrix factorization is another way to solve the uh, cocktail party problem which has been uh observed to be very well performing lately because before they used these independent component analysis that had the drawback that you had to have as many um, sound recordings as many sources and with non-negative matrix factorization you don't have this constraint um, so i'm not an expert uh, in here I guess that you can apply it into general context. So what you were mentioning, for example, in the orchestra uh, source separation. Um, so um, this is, let's say, a parallel, um, a parallel algorithm to what we are implementing. We are doing like an alternative um, solution. That is this, um, maybe I missed a point uh, in your question. Or these answers? Uh, uh, no, okay. but what I was just wondering is if it was um, when you were describing, uh, and, and this it said it was quite effective in music, um, and I was wondering, it, it could have been, but I was, you know, misunderstanding the, the part because it had my mind thinking towards um, if it could separate sounds like that, if a model could be made so that, you know, computers, machine learning could actually learn to play music using this model, you know, understanding the balances between sounds and how they're all relating to each other. If um, a machine learning thing could, you know, um, adjust things and, and understand how the balance would go. That was just my, my, my simple musings, but so, sorry if I was missing the point. <laughs> no, 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 it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, um... Just a more general comment on my side. These kind of models and algorithms are very task specific. So they are basically, they contain a set of parameters, these weights that you train on a specific task to do a specific job based on that data set. And they, uh, it's very challenging to make them generalize within the same task to uh, a data set that is only slightly different. So using an algorithm, exactly the same model that you need, you use for blind source separation, um, I would say that maybe you exploit similar mechanism, but you cannot apply the exact same network to perform something else, such as 
learning music. There are, of course, points in common, but you need every time to retrain something on the specific task and data set you want to work on. So, again, maybe uh, I missed I your point again. <laughs> No, no, no. This is no. This is this is my error, and because um, what you're talking about is absolutely fascinating and quite complex, and I'm very, very impressed um, with what you're working on. So, thank you very much for indulging my my thoughts and my questions. Amazing work. No, of course, it's interesting to to see all point these points of view. And thanks again for the question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, are there any last questions or comments? Um, if not, um, your idea uh, has been going on for over an hour and a half. Uh, Dean, do you have a question? Yet? Yeah, I guess I do. Um, uh, you say that I realize that this is a simple system, but yet it is flexible enough so that it can be used on visual data, even though it was created to, to process audio data. So uh, would it be possible to modify it such that it processes spoken language in order to determine which language it is that is being spoken? I don't talk about translational interpretation, just determining which language it is. Ah, that's, uh, that's actually a very cool uh, application that one could think of. Uh, I haven't tried it. Um, what I could say is that um, for sure you can uh, extract different features from different languages in terms of the spectrogram. So, for example, in terms of frequency, maybe pace uh, at which the different syllables are coming one after the other. So, there are some temporal features that the model could detect. Uh, I am not 100% optimistic that then this would work very well in the sense that uh, you would need a very large training set and uh, the, the model right now, um, as you uh, maybe you remember from some of the figures, when you have a large number of sounds or very, uh, a large number of mixtures, then the performance of the model was uh, was going was decreasing with the complexity of the tasks, which would be a bit uh, incompatible with having large training sets that you need, for example, for language detection. But with all the modifications that we were thinking about, for example, not using the PCA, but using multiple dimensions or using different ways of, uh, of decoding the, the signal, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. I think definitely it requires a modification, but the core in principle detects temporal features that are um, relate that could be related to language features. So after this, <laughs> after this discussion, now I would need like two months to apply all the suggestions that uh, uh, you gave me, which are super interesting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I hope we didn't. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> we didn't overwhelm. <laughs> it's really easy to suggest things, right? It's hard to do the actual work. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> Maybe not hard, but definitely time consuming. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, whoever made suggestions to be included, please offer some help. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> you get those done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, let us know. Uh, reach out to us, and then we maybe we can we can all help and publish a paper together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, anyone that wants to reach out and 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 help with implementing those ideas, uh, let us know. <laughs> Gilbert, do you, you and Mike? Okay, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, offering uh, so much of your time and to share this really interesting research. Uh, you can see that it sparked a lot of ideas in us, so we are really glad that you came to, um, you know, to answer all the questions and to 
to um, yeah to listen to our ideas. So and um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming and for asking questions, for interacting. And Georgia, as I said, reach out, tell people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> And I hope you'll come back one day and give us updates uh, what you do on the next, you know, chapter of your life. And uh, congratulations, and we wish you all the best for your future. Of course. I uh, first of all, thanks again for inviting. I really appreciate it. Was uh, such a nice chat with a lot of ideas. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Thanks again. And then uh, I mentioned it already when we met last time. Uh, I'd um, uh, I'd really love to join as an audience um, one of the next uh, rooms. Uh, I've seen there are some super interesting topics. Um, so yeah, we oh yeah, feel always welcome to come and to speak. Uh, so if I see you, I'll invite you to come up to the stage and, and participate in the discussion. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, we are always happy to hear if you find this interest to you so thank you with pleasure yeah we'll definitely we'll definitely welcome you for sure and um normally we would uh i, I would wish you good luck but this is such remarkable work here that you don't need any one <laughs> uh, luck in getting your phd and uh coming to us again as a doctor and uh thank you so so much for your time and your incredible work thank, thank you, you so much for your curiosity very appreciate it Wonderful. Okay, we are looking forward to seeing you, hearing you, hearing you again. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you can use Clubhouse one <laughs> for continuing. But um, yeah, and thanks everyone. Um, uh, if you like discussions like these, for um, follow the club, uh, become a member of the club, and our next room is tomorrow. Um, uh, Doctor. Nikki, who will talk about uh, self-assembled self -assembled logic circuits uh, based on proteins. Uh, so that would be will be really interesting. And then on um, Thursday, we will have um, Dr. Q, a more climate room, uh, talking about the expansion of uh, the desert climate in Central Asia. And uh, on Friday, we'll have uh, Dr. Kagan talking about gene mutations across species that shed light on aging and solving aging maybe one day. So yeah, thank you again, Bjorda. It was such an honor having you here. And um, yeah, we'll hear you all back soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Thank you so much, goodbye. Three, two, one, bye everyone.